from CCQB, so I would like to call this uh, meeting of the City of Salem Budget Committee to order. And uh, could we uh, please have a roll call? Mayor Peterson? <clears throat> Here. Member Bennett? Here. Member Tesler? Absent. Member Nanke? Here. Member Clausen? Here. Member Dickey? Absent. Member Thomas? Here. Member Cannon? Absent. Member Clem? Here. Member Berger? Here. Member Kyla White? Here. Member George? Here. Member McEvely? Here. Member Strozit? Here. Member Motley? Here. Member Pruitt? Here. All right, let's see. Uh, could we have uh, Member Pruitt lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well done, Member Pruitt. Excuse me, Chair Strozzi. <coughs> Could we get the... PA system turned up a bit. I'm having trouble hearing. Thank you. I, I have a bug, so I'm have, I can't mm. tell if it's just me. Or I, but I thought that some of these were a little low. You want me to test mine? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you want to be our official tester, <laughs> just so. <laughs> Next, we'll have you taste the food. And <laughs> um, so, uh, if if the uh, sound system could be checked, we'll go ahead. But that they're doing that. Great. Yeah. Okay. okay. But in the meantime, I think we'll move along. And uh, next up is uh, number three, which is the election of officers. Um, uh, I want to uh, make a nomination. Member Peterson. Yes, I'd like to nominate Chuck Bennett as chair. Second. All right, yeah, Member Motley. Yes, I move that we uh, defer consideration of this until our meeting of January 11. We have a motion on the floor. Yeah, we have floor. a motion on the floor. I don't know, would that, would that qualify as a substitute motion? A motion to defer to time certain is in order. It is this, in order? Yeah, that is right. Okay. I'd like to second it for purposes of discussion. Rationale for your motion, please. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe that we uh, would, it would be, a, be a, uh, just a good thing and all the way around that we defer this until our meeting on January 11. Uh, that would allow our three missing counselors to participate. It would allow the council to um, uh, appoint our new members if they have not already done so and allow those new members to participate in the vote for the officers. Um, just a, a feeling here. We have we have two, I believe, vacant slots that won't uh, be effective, won't take effect until January. I'd like to see those people able to participate in the nomination and voting process. Do we have any other discussion? Yes. Um, I guess the question is for Linda. How many meetings do we have between now and then? This is the only meeting we have between now and then. Okay. The thought, this is a little earlier than we normally go through this process, but the thought was because we've changed the process for this coming budget cycle, uh, we will have the meetings on January 11th and 25th when we have the department presentations. And so the thought was to get this part out of the way as we move, so we can move forward with the new chair starting in those first budget committee meetings in January. That's why it's on this agenda. I'd like to speak to my motion. Okay. Um, I, I believe that this is a timely uh, process and it makes sense in terms of the new, um, the new way that we really want to work with the budget committee as a whole. And we need to rethink, I believe, the way that council and the budget committee have worked separately in a way in the past. And in my effort to try to unify this as a budget committee, I see it's important to have a budget chair selected this evening who can begin to assist me with 
unifying our budget committee together, and that's why I would like to proceed and have this election this evening. Uh, I, uh, F, I'm going to speak and then Member Klim. Uh, I concur with the mayor, and uh, just to have a, a personal point, uh, I um, did not anticipate chairing past the election of officers tonight, <laughs> simply. <laughs> it's not just because I'm anxious to get out the door, it's actually because I had a lingering bug and I just don't think I'll make it through the meeting chairing it. I, I intend to stay here, but uh, my voice is not going to last. But um, I, I really think with the challenging budget year ahead, I, I fully support uh, Member Bennett uh, succeeding me, we need to have someone who is very experienced at running meetings. You're going to have lots of additional public meetings, and you're going to have some very contention, potentially contentious meetings. And uh, it's it's not an easy job you, to uh, balance all of those interests. But if we don't have elections tonight, then uh, our, my vice chair will shortly be taking over and be announced to you. <laughs> yes, Member Clem. Um, just wanted to confirm, Linda, that uh, it, 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 have we fallen into some practice where there's a member of the budget committee and then a member of council and a member of budget? So this that next has. iteration, and I fully support Mayor Peterson's motion. Uh, it would be a council member. That's correct. And, and uh, Council President Bennett has chaired the budget committee um, a couple of years ago when we really had a, our first budget crisis about five years ago. So I'll be supporting. Thank you. Do we have further discussion? All right, now if I'm keeping track, which I won't guarantee, we would first vote on Member Motley's motion. Was there a second? I think yes. that's, yeah, second. 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 Okay. So uh, the motion was to defer election of officers until January, is that correct? Any further discussion on that motion? All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. 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 Uh, could we have the ayes raise your hands, please, just to make sure. All right, that motion fails. Now we can return to the uh, motion made by Member Peterson, Mayor Peterson. And uh, that was to uh, nominate uh, Member Bennett to be the chair of the Budget Committee. All those in favor of that motion, aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, I think that's unanimous. And uh, I am ready to turn over the gavel. <laughs> <laughs> She's quick. Now that you're the battlefield. And I'd like to say before right. you leave, uh, thank you to you, Darlene, oh, and the, the work and the extra time that you spent this last budget cycle. We appreciate very much your service. And one last time, just I want to commend the mayor for being such a, being so great about uh, deferring her chair to the budget <laughs> committee chair. It's very difficult to do and she's been unusually gracious about it. Well, thank you, and uh, I'm just going to take a moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to uh, to chairing this, uh, as was mentioned, I've done this before when we've had similar circumstances and uh, look forward to working with all of you and particularly want to thank uh, Member Strozit uh, for the outstanding work she did. Uh, this was, this is uh, at times a difficult job. So thank you very much. Yes, I can Terry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> congratulations first. Um, I'm bringing this up not because you're the new chair. I was going to bring this up anyway. I don't know if this is the appropriate time to address rules of the committee or whether or not we would address that in the other business at the end of tonight's meeting. Yeah, it'll be under other business. Our next order of business is to elect a vice chairperson. 
Member Motley. Thank you. Uh, also, congratulations. Uh, I nominate uh, uh, Councilman Clausen as Vice Chair. Are there any other nominations? Okay, nominations are closed. All those in favor of member Clausen as vice chair? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimously, okay. And for, <laughs> congratulations, member Clausen. And we need nominations for a secretary. Who gets to take all the minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Pruitt can write. <laughs> <laughs> Member Motley. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the position of secretary, uh, I nominate volunteer um, Pruitt, please. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Clem. Are there any other nominations for secretary? All those in favor of Member Pruitt for secretary say aye. 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 All those opposed? Member Pruitt is secretary. Congratulations. Okay, next item of business is the minutes. Have you all had a chance to take a look at them? Motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Seconded by uh, Keitelweit. Any comments? Yes, Member Motley. Discussion, thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a um, suggested uh, amendment to our minutes from uh, October 19th before we ratify those. That is under number six, uh, 6A and 6B. We were indeed given uh, two FY 2010-2011 documentations that did deal with member uh, Motley I'm going to take just a moment you're yes. right your machine is not working I, I is really that the problem yeah, it's just... hello testing there we go thank you <laughs> it just turned way down okay, oh, okay. Oh. let's try this again um, uh, I, I believe that there is an error or an overstatement misstatement in the uh, minutes from the October 19th meeting at items 6A and 6B uh, regarding the 2010-2011 year-end reports. Um, they were indeed uh, year-end reports in the, the fact that they uh, ceased reporting for the period ended June 30th. However, they were in fact fourth quarter reports, not annual financial reports. Um, annual finan they were roughly 80 pages short of a true annual financial report and were woefully lacking in detail. Uh, they would have made a fine executive summary for an annual report, but they were not in fact the City of Salem's annual financial report for Member either Motley, entity. Could you, could you present this as a motion? I'm just not clear I am. how you'd like to change it. Change it I am. No, you're discussing the motion. Just give me the, what, how would you like to change the line? I'm see okay, thank you very much. That's okay. Uh, I'd like to see uh, 6A and 6B, respectively, uh, the words year end annual financial report amended to read fourth quarter financial report. Need a second? Second. Second by member Machiavelli. Now go ahead. Thank I you. Understand. I think we've heard a lot of your comments. Yeah, I think, I think it's already been said. They weren't annual financial reports. They were fourth quarter reports. Um, uh, Ms. Neville, is this the way that we normally title that report? Uh, thank you, Deborah Neville, budget officer. I don't recall if we call the last quarter, fourth quarter report year end or fourth quarter. They're basically representing the same time period. It's not any different. Um, like I said, I don't recall specifically. Okay, you've all heard the motion. It's to relabel this the fourth quarter financial report. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. And that is on both items, is that correct? Yeah, on both items. Thank you. That's A and B, 6A and B. 
Any further amendments to the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. Somebody? So Mo was out there, he amended it, right? Yeah, he amended it. So now oh, it's back to the main motion as amended. Yeah. Okay, back to the main motion as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, motion passed. Ms. Neville, is there any correspondence? Mr. Chair, there is no correspondence this evening. Okay. Okay, City Manager Norris will now present the five-year forecast. Okay, and we'll just turn on the presentation. I'll, I'll go ahead and begin while we bring that up. And good evening. I appreciate this opportunity to present the next year, the next five year forecast for the general fund. And as you know from the material re you received, this forecast is for fiscal year 2012 13 through 2016 17. And for our audience members, the city's fiscal year begins on July 1st of every year and ends the following June 30th. We prepare an, a five-year forecast every year after receiving our property tax levy information in November. The forecast is a planning document. It's not a budget, uh, but they are used as a base for uh, guiding the development of the budget strategy over a several-year perspective. We look at this uh, over several years so that we can look at this stability of the general fund in different scenarios and over a longer period of time. As is the case with all forecasts, the data represents our best inf information at this time about anticipated revenue and expenditures. Financial forecasts are always the most accurate in the first two or three years because we have more information during that time period and things can change before the generally third through the fifth year, but it gives, it's always a good idea to take that longer look at our finances. We sent the forecast to you in advance, so I'm not going to go over all of the forecast assumptions unless you have questions. I just want to hit the main points. Again, this year we developed a Schedule A, which demonstrates the forecasted impact if we continue current general fund services. Schedule B demonstrates an alternative scenario for financial stability over time by reducing our current service levels. I want to address revenue, expenditures, and savings, and then talk about the differences from Schedule A and B. So what's changed from the last forecast? Primarily, we've scaled back our assumptions about revenue. The first line here talks about, uh, shows what we had in last year's forecast for revenue each of the years and then in this current forecast. And you can see that the largest changes are in the last two to three years of the forecast. The prolonged economic downturn that we're all in lowered assessed valuations increasing losses to property tax revenue from compression, and continued flat or declining sources of revenue from our other non-property tax sources, I think require us to make this adjustment. The assumption about current revenue is now is it'll grow about 1.2% a year, less, approximately 800,000 each year that we're putting in for property tax compression throughout the time period of the forecast. If compression losses are higher, or if we don't see overall revenue increases of at least 1.2%, then further reductions will be needed each year as we look at the budget. This chart shows property tax increases over time, and you can see that property tax, the rate of growth in property tax was staying at about the 5% level for several years and then dropped pretty significantly um, in 9-10. Then it looked like it was gonna stay stable and maybe was moving up to some degree and that's what uh, we heard from the economist we work with that he anticipated that it would increase somewhat. 
But then what happened is that it dropped again to just a little over 1%. Next year in 2012 or 2013, we think we'll see a little bit of an increase because of some of the other revenue sources that we know will be going up somewhat. I also want to show you what's happening with compression. This shows, this table shows from 2000, 2001, we lost about 45,000 to compression. And this year it grew, and you can see it's been growing at about 200,000 a year since the 910 fiscal year. This year we were at almost 602,000 loss to compression. And in 12, 13, and for the years throughout, the forecasts were assuming about 800,000 in addition, com additional compression losses. And this loss is um, kind of in a summary format. It's ballot measure 50, um, separated real market value from assessed valuation, set property tax based on assessed valuation, and then when real market value drops so that it gets closer to assess valuation, we don't have that automatic 3% a year increase. And that's, we're finding that's happening more frequently. Operating expenditures continue to grow um, in spite of our loss in property tax in Schedule A, and we've scaled them back in Schedule B to keep up with the difference in our total resources. Adopting a balanced budget means that budgeted operating expenditures do not exceed budgeted total resources. Over the last four fiscal years, we have budgeted for current service levels, but have achieved savings each year and have been able to build up our beginning working capital. We did this in anticipation of having a prolonged economic downturn. And we knew that we had some large cost increases coming up, and those, some of those were related to the mandated increases in PERS rates. The beginning working capital was budgeted this year at 17.2 million. As I explained last budget year, we now need to start drawing that down for our operating expenses if we continue our current service levels. If we do this, if we don't make any changes to our current service levels, the beginning working capital is going to decrease fairly rapidly. And my recommendation is that we not ever go below $10 million beginning working capital. As you know, general fund services are labor intensive, as this slide shows. Delivering core services to the public requires a lot of employees. Those are employees like police officers, dispatchers, planners, firefighters, mechanics, code enforcement librarians, analysts, programmers, parking enforcement, court clerks, administrative assistants, attorneys, parks employees, and many others. It's a very labor-intensive service. Costs also include things like equipment and vehicles and buildings, fuel, professional services, safety devices, information technology, general liability insurance, and others to deliver these same services. Our largest expenditures in any city's general fund, however, is for labor, and that includes wages, overtime, health insurances, workers' comp, social security, and retirement. Starting July 1st of this year, the labor cost with the sharpest rate of increase, as you all know, I think, was related to PERS. That increase was necessary because of market losses to the state plan starting in 2008 when they, we began to experience a downturn in the economy. As with all retirement plans, PERS must remain actuarially sound in order to meet its commitments and its obligations. PERS rates are adjusted every two years. Uh, rates are scheduled to increase again. They increased July 1st of this year. They're scheduled to increase again in July of 2013. And what we didn't know in the last forecast, but we built into this forecast, is we expect another large increase right now in July of 2015, unless market increases make up for the loss. The last forecast, um, as I said, didn't include that. But once the fund, the PERS fund stabilizes, rates will begin to decrease. We won't see these large increases any longer. I think it's important to point out, I know there's a lot of discussion about retirement amounts. Um, it's important to point out that these adjustments don't add to employees' retirement benefits. They just go toward stabilizing the, the PERS retirement fund so it meets its obligations. 
to talk a little bit about expenditures and savings. Although we've made reductions in each budget since July of 2008, and you all, if you've been on the budget committee for very long, you're very aware of the kinds of uh, reductions that we've made. Our service levels have stayed fairly constant from that first big reduction in 2008. We've adopted balanced budgets and built up our beginning working capital because of the savings each year and keeping our operations costs at less than current revenue. This line shows the percent of operating budget that we've spent every year. And so the difference is the savings we've had. This line shows that after the first two years when we were spending down the Quest reserves, which some of you recall, we've kept our actual costs less than current revenue. But in 2010-11, we're right at 99.9% .9 of current revenue. There are several factors that make this increasingly difficult to achieve the kind of savings every year in the future that we've been receiving in the past, and I want to go over what those differences are. Our costs are increasing at 3.3%, and revenue is predicted to increase at 1.2%. PERS increases alone added 2.2 million in costs each year to the general fund beginning in July 1st of this year. We've already cut positions, reduced material and service budgets, reduced the size of our fleet, and cut back on overtime expenditures. On the other hand, we've added parks and taken on a number of new projects. We have fewer opportunities for savings each year because of these changes that we've experienced. As you can see from this chart, the last two lines, fire and police costs are almost half of the cost of the general fund. And most of our savings have come from these budgets because of the size of them. A few crimes or fires or weather emergencies that require large overtime costs can significantly impact our ability to achieve the kind of cost savings that we've had in the past. As of this year, we don't believe we will have very much in savings in the fire department because of reductions we've made in that budget over time. And you can see from the size of the other budgets, if we had to cut 10 and a half million without having any reductions in fire and police, we would be totally eliminating some departments or some services. We've rarely had to draw down from the general fund contingency of two and a half million for several years. We anticipate that to be the case throughout the forecast period. However, as our ability to save every year is uh, being restricted, if we have unforeseen contingencies that we don't have savings in department budgets to handle, we're more likely to have to start drawing each year a little bit from general fund contingencies. And then if that happens, we have to build it back up again to two and a half million the following year, and so we'd need some other reductions in order to be able to do that. Our history is that we've been able to save, as you saw, between three and four percent of operating budgets every year. These, uh, what I'm calling normal savings, come from things like positions being left vacant for a period of time, projects that come in under budget, uh, grant revenue that we receive uh, that we're able to accomplish more projects sooner with, overtime savings and related examples. We anticipate that we'll continue to have these savings, but as the size of our budgets gets smaller, our ability to keep those at about three and a half to four percent, I think, is increasingly um, less likely. Next, I'd like to talk about the differences in Schedule A and Schedule B. And I know this is going to be hard to read here. You have it in your financial forecast, but the yellow highlighted numbers are the ones I want to talk about. As Schedule A demonstrates, with the cost of our current system over time, and even if we save 4% a year, by the fiscal year that starts in July 1st, 2013, the year after next, our anticipated budget expenditures will be over 111 million and our total resources will be projected at 105 million. We'd need to reduce budgeted operating expenses by approximately six and a half million in order to adopt a balanced budget that year. Because again, a balanced budget for adoption means that your budgeted expenditures are less than your budgeted total resources. Our ending fund balance would then only be whatever unspent contingency dollars we had in any savings we achieved throughout the year. And I know you won't be surprised to hear that I am not recommending Schedule A. <laughs> okay. So Schedule B, which we're calling a budget balancing scenario. 
This one's better, but it won't be easy because it's gonna take some reductions, ongoing reductions to our service levels. We keep the budget uh, operations in line with total resources until 2016-17. In that year, in this uh, forecast, the expenditures would exceed revenue. But that's far enough away that a lot of things can change between now and then. So I think this um, scenario is one that will meet our needs over time. It downsizes our services again and to keep but operating expenses closer in line with expected revenue. It also requires that we begin a slow s drawdown of our beginning working capital, which is really what we had anticipated as we were building that up for the last few years. Schedule B calls for, in addition to our, what I'm calling normal savings from position vacancies and other things like that, we would make a million dollars in sustainable reductions the reductions that would carry on throughout the forecast period yet this year. If we're not able to save at the level that we are anticipating or if our revenue drops further, we'll need to have more sustained reductions. My and my department head group's recommendation is to consider making larger reductions between now and June of 2013 so that we don't have to do, um, and if you could look at the back chart, would be making a million dollars, um, I'm sorry, that's not very convenient for many of you, a million dollars in sustained cuts, oh, it's not showing here, in this year, in 11-13, and then would have to do another two and a half million in 12-13, almost blinded you, Councillor Bennett, another three and a half million the following year, and three and a half million in 14-15. So that's a scenario. Another scenario is we could cut a little deeper than that earlier and then have those savings for a longer time period. We need your help in scaling services to a level that we can afford during this prolonged economic slowdown. Once the city's revenue situation improves, services can be added back. I'm hoping that we're talking about a four or five year period. I'm hoping it's not that long. It may be though. Um, when we originally started, I thought it would be three or four years and we're now four years later still in it. So it's hard to know for sure. <coughs> so in summary, the forecast is an important planning document and I appreciate you being here tonight to go over it. And I know many of you have had an opportunity since you received it electronically to look at it. We have some big changes to make, but we have time to make thoughtful decisions. We do need to reduce our budget operating expenditures to get closer in line with current revenue. Again, we need to identify about a million dollars in sustained reductions in this fiscal year. And w uh, we can do that, and we have time to make these important decisions for this community if we start drawing down from the beginning working capital now, and if we can meet our savings targets. Next week, I'll be meeting in a work session with City Council on December 5th, and I know the Budget Committee members are um, encouraged and welcome to attend that, to go over some guiding principles for putting the budget together and some budget strategies. And Council will deliberate about those and uh, give me your sense of direction. Once I receive that direction, departments will go further with preparing their budgets for 2012-13. And then we will be having the department presentations in January, January 11th and 25th, hopefully. Right now we anticipate being able to have a couple of public forums the end of January and early February. And um, then I will be working putting together the, with the department heads the final recommended budget. And the budget office will be calculating the numbers and making sure that proposed budget is correct and then we'll start the budget committee meetings uh, right after that. So that, Mr. Chair, that completes my overview of the forecast. Thank you, Manager Norris. Member Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, two quick questions. One, uh, first and foremost, on the uh, compression. Yes. We see almost what might be considered a linear line, but then we stop and future years stay at 800,000 rationale for that? In talking to the interim county assessor, he f believes we're 
at about the bottom of the compression. I don't know whether that will be the case or not. So my recommendation is that we have the 812,000 in for uh, fiscal year 12, 13, and then we continue to monitor that, and I'm assuming we'll adjust it either up or down over the following years of the forecast. Okay, and second, if I may, in regards to Schedule B, yes, and your recommendation, but then you stated that it potentially your recommendation to cut more sooner, rather than to save money, rather than move it out. If on the schedule as it appears before you, if you just added the dollar amounts of the cuts we would have to make, it's about ten and a half million. And that's if we make some now and some each of the next three fiscal years. We won't have to cut that much if we make uh, the reduction sooner because we'll have those savings uh, for the remainder of the forecast period. I think the important thing to weigh always is we don't want to cut too much too soon. What we're here to do is deliver services to the community. And so we may want to make just a little bit deeper this year and next year and then see what's happening with revenue and see what the impacts are from our uh, operating reductions and then decide what level of reductions we need to make the next two years. I wouldn't recommend doing the full 10 and a half um, this year and next year because that may be deeper than we need to go. And that's kind of direction you're looking for after work session? Yes, take next place week. as well? Yes. Okay, thanks. Member Kloss. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, so one of the men, one of the things you mentioned on Schedule B was for 11, well actually you said a million dollars of sustainable reductions this year. Did that mean in the 11-12 current budget? It does. Okay, and if so, is that being done administratively? Does that take a council or budget committee action or how are we doing that, do we know? I asked departments to prepare um, about a month ago if we had to cut 10%, what would it be? Knowing that we're not gonna have to cut any place close to 10%, but just to get a sense of what that would be. And they identified what a normal savings would be for their department and then what some one-time reductions would be and then what potentially some longer-term reductions could be. My recommendation is that we move forward with those normal savings, one-time reductions, and what we think would be long-term reductions, and do that administratively unless it has something to do with the council policy. If we were going to change hours at the library or close a service, that definitely needs to come back to the city council for your policy decision. But I think at this point, when we're making the reductions now and then uh, codifying it, if you will, in the next year's budget, we would be bringing those back to you during the budget committee presentations. Okay, so that would be maybe a report back saying this is where we're looking at the million dollars in reduction. Because yes. I'm, I'm, and I'm saying reduction, not saving. I'm saying that right. That's right. Correct. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Any further? Yeah, I have a, a question just for clarification. Mm -hmm. You've asked department heads uh, to bring to you reductions of 10 percent, but yes. I know from talking with you in the past, it's not been your policy to make across the board cuts. No. Could you talk about that a little I bit? I will. I, I don't believe in making across the board cuts because what, what happens w with that is that you weaken every service in the city. And I, th I think we need to make strategic decisions about what we're reducing. So when we looked at 10%, it was just to look at a starting point. And I can tell you right now there are things on that list that I don't think any of you would support in terms of reductions because of the impact it has on the community. But we needed to take a look at what that would be so we know uh, where to start. There are things that I think we can do in terms of deploying services differently and looking at our cost structure and looking at how we do services that I think makes sense. There are a few small things I think we can do in regard to revenue that I think um, the budget committee and the council would be supportive of. So it's not all just cutting services. The other thing is looking at what our resources are and uh, what some you know reductions might be to how we operate or what we pay for software licenses or things like that that don't reduce services but just reduce our costs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Member 
clap. Thank you, um, Chair Bennett. Uh, Linda, nice mm -hmm. presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I, uh, one of the things I know that we, as Mayor Peterson indicated, uh, a different way of uh, looking at the budget committee and the interaction with council. Um, one of the ideas that we've discussed in the past, and I'm just trying to think ahead, mm -hmm. so it, it's not so much for tonight, is the whole issue of contingencies. Are they in every account? Are they in a separate account? And then are they part of the ending fund balance? Mm -hmm. There uh, questions came up in the last budget cycle. What's your real cash balance? I mean, it, it isn't that we want to spend it. Thank that you. isn't the point. But um, <laughs> as we move forward, yeah. um, I, I think I'm, after even a few years at this, looking for greater clarity for you know, what are we really sort of What's our true contingency amount? Yes. Uh, people have said you have too much money. Um, I, going forward, I'm not sure I, I would yeah. concur with that completely. But the other thing that I had a question about is is the uh, the property tax. I just want a, a sort of a confirmation of this. Real market values could go up, and it wouldn't change our property tax receipts that we anticipate. Is that correct or not? It, it's based on a property by property basis. So if real market value went up on a piece of property that was nearing compression right now, we would be able to see that 3% increase on property tax for that property. If it went down, we might not be seeing the 3%. And then I'm wondering, um, Mr. Duncan, if you can come and probably give him a little more thorough explanation of the measure 50 and compression. And he didn't know I was going to do this, so. <laughs> I'll do my best to explain it. Um, with measure five, compression came into effect where the permanent rates that were set previously by 47 and 50 um, were then capped on what you can receive for local governments at $10 for local government agencies per thousand. And if you take a look at those permanent rates for the Marion County area, sorry, I don't know off the top of my head, the Polk County, um, it equates to a little over $11. So um, looking at those two together, and this is where it becomes a little more complicated. If you do a ratio, sorry about that, uh, once you get to about 87% of real market value, then you enter into compression. So oftentimes we tend to think compression only happens when real market value hits assessed value, but that's not the case. It actually happens a little bit before that. Okay, and that's really, I'm wanting right. clarity in that issue yes. because here's what's going on down my street. Everybody's paying more property tax, and yet we're getting less. It, 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 there, there's got to be um, a, a, a lay person's understanding, not to diminish what mm -hmm. the complex environment that staff operates in, maybe with a tax assessor, but they're paying more, and why has the city got less? I, it, it, it's we got to find a way to understand that better. Um, and so I'm just yes. trying to think we, ahead. We'll of the have um, some maybe the assessor come over and do um, a better explanation or a well, or if we could include it in your proposed budget, we can do. I, I got to see how I can yeah. explain it to my neighbors. And right as now I, I can. understand from talking to the county, that what they're finding in Marion County is. Uh, compression is hitting more of the higher end housing than lower end housing. And there's more higher end housing in, and when you look at Marion County, most of the higher end housing is in Salem. And so we're having a bigger impact from compression than some of the other areas. But we'll do a more complete explanation uh, as we get through the budget so that it's easier for people to understand. It's a complex issue. Member Mac. To follow up on Member Clem's question, though, the compression number that's budgeted in, is that based on a certain market value assumption, or how, how is that, how's that longer term compression number created? Yes. That's to be an underlying assumption to, to real value. And, well, it's not quite as scientific as that uh, because we don't have enough information to really do that analysis. We can see that it's been growing by about 200000 a year every year for the last four years. And from um, Ms. Neville's discussions with the interim assessor, we think that there will be some additional loss, but then we'll 
then likely we'll have s the losses won't continue to grow. So we feel fairly comfortable with the about 800,000 that we have in the forecast, but recognize that we're likely to have to move that either up or down of the following years of the forecast as we do this each fall, as we know more. It's, it's a fairly, um, it's an increasing phenomena right now, and so it's a little hard to predict. Second question, different topic. If you had improving financial markets, mm -hmm. what are the, if you did have good, solidly improving financial markets, then that might virtually eliminate the future additional PERS pickups, true or false? I'm, I'm sorry, if we had? Because the, the, the increase in the PERS rates is to re restore the fund stability based on market losses of nine and 10. If you had improving financial markets, would the projected PERS increases then go away? Yes, when, when PERS rates are set, they're set every two years, and they look at what happened in um, two years previously. So it lags the market to some extent. So if, if in the next two years or three years we had significant improvement in the investment market, there likely would not need to be such a large increase in 15, 16 as we projected in the forecast. <clears throat> I don't see any signs from the economists I've listened to or the economic reports that I've read that that's likely to happen over the next two or three years. And the third question, different topic again. With this information out there or your projections, is the city's credit rating at any risk of being lowered? No, I don't believe so. As long as we continue to uh, take the steps we need to take to make sure that we have financial stability, uh, that we keep an adequate level of reserves, that we're planning ahead, that we're keeping our service system closer in line with our resources, I think we'll continue to have a very strong uh, credit rating. Any other questions? Member Motley. <laughs> yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but we, but the the citizens have the capacity um, regarding uh, Measure Five Forty Nine Fifty One Two Three and on and up. Uh, they could pass a, a local option levy to maintain services if they so desired. Could they not? That's correct. Okay, and then my second question is. Is that a motion? I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> it would make I, my I life easier. <laughs> I, I didn't say it would be easy or popular. I just said it, it is a it's po possible. It, it is legally possible. That's correct. Okay, um, would, would that be, uh, since you uh, spoke of Chair Bennett, would, would that be a, a double majority vote? Are local no. option taxes double majority? No. Okay. Uh, next question. Has anyone, to, to your knowledge, or Ms. Nevels or Mr. Tosh or whomever, has any local government ever questioned or tested what happened if they didn't pay PERS as much as PERS wanted? If PERS says to us, your rate's 15%, we say, okay, here's 12 what are they going to do? Sue us? Uh, Mr. Tosh, do you have a... I, d I don't know of any public agency that's done that. They would most likely sue us. Pardon me? They would most likely sue us. They would sue us? Yeah. On behalf of the PERS members. Yeah. Uh, the other way, the other thing that could happen is the, the members are uh, ben beneficiaries of the PERS system, and so they would probably have standing to bring an independent action themselves. I mean, it's... The, you know, you're, this is this is terra. This would be terra incognito, but there would be uh, litigation that would most likely mm -hmm. result from something like that. Thank you. So we might get away with pushing off some money for a year or two. 
I, I, the problem is that if several agencies decided to do something like that, it puts the system in a further negative spin and it would only increase the costs over time. But let's bear in mind that that, that uh, financial stability by the actuaries is based on a 50-year life. Mm -hmm. Any further Thank questions? You. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. This is the time uh, we set aside for public testimony. Is there anyone who'd like to address the budget committee? Other business? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just offer that on the handout material item 7A, I know we said information only, but if you'd like to have an overview, a verbal overview of that, I'd be happy to provide that. Um, I'm just making an offer. I'll let it leave it to the budget committee. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you could also call that beginning year. <laughs> Thank you for coming prepared to make that presentation, too. Okay, we are on other business then. Terry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I probably should have put this out earlier so the staff could have distributed the committee procedures to everybody because I think I'm the only one that has one and only because Deborah went and got it for me. Um, we, we made a change last year and, 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 and first I want to clarify that this is correct, that the document that Deborah gave me says that it takes a um, two-thirds vote of all members to change committee rules. I want to make sure that's accurate because I don't remember that two-thirds number being in there last year when we made a number of rules changes. Is that, I mean? Well, this, this is, Mr. McEvely, this is the um, procedures that the committee did adopt. These are the, the, the standing rules. We call them right. Like yeah, I just didn't remember the two-thirds yes. being in there. Yeah, that okay. was in there from the beginning. Well, I know I'm going to be barking up a wrong tree here, but a year ago we we made a change that um, somewhat changed the role of the committee chairperson. Um, and the current rules read that the uh, uh, presiding officer may now move second and uh, debate from the chair. And I, I think the addition that we made last year was that the presiding officer may move in second. I believe they've always had the right to debate from the chair. And I felt, kind of with that. I felt personally that was a mistake when we did that last year. The presiding officer has enough to do in trying to run the meeting. The presiding officer would certainly be able to find people to move or second on his behalf. I realize we have to give seven days public notice before we can take a vote on anything. So I'm really not sure if I'm putting this into a motion or asking it to go into the public notice, but I would, I would like, the ultimate goal is to make a motion to remove the presiding officer's ability to move and second, not limit the presiding officer's role to debate because I think the input from the chair is important, but I, I think it becomes cumbersome if we allow the presiding officer to move and second. So I guess I'm, if I'm, am I making a motion or am I supposed to wait six days to make the motion or? You're, you're welcome to put any motion on the floor you'd like. Okay, so I, I would like to, to move that we would amend um, section five, section B um, of the budget committee procedures to uh, strike the words in B, uh, the presiding officer may move second in debate to change that sentence to the presiding officer may debate from the chair and strike the words move and second. Is there a second? Member Motley, okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Unless he wants to speak. Would you like to speak to it further? 
but it just, I just think that it, being my fourth year on the committee and having observed the, the policies and procedures before, it worked very well when the presiding officer was functioned primarily to keep the movie, the, the, the meeting moving, the meeting going in a certain direction, because that takes a lot of concentration and a lot of time. Again, I would not ever want to limit the chair's ability to debate because that neutralizes you on the committee, but I, I do think that there's enough to do without having to worry about motions and seconds making yourself. And I, I just think that I observed the prior three years the system worked very well and I could see, not necessarily in your case, that's why I said earlier it's not because you're the chair. I think you're a great choice for the chair. I, I just see that in the future being a problem if we're allowing the chair to, to move and to second. Member Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I recall, the reason we did that is because that's how the council operates, whereas Robert's Rules of Orders restrict the presiding officer from those functions. City Council allows them, and so it was just essentially, in all of our different hats, we've been trying to make the same rules. Um, I personally don't see the chair making a, a motion or seconding a motion um, a burden on their position, actually. It would be more of a burden to actually ask me to make a motion for him that I don't really understand maybe to where in debate he's going to be speaking to the motion that I made for him. So it, to me it's, it's more actually confusing um, to not allow the presiding officer, which is I think why city council elected to, to put that position in place um, at the onset of, of its rules. I, I wouldn't support that motion. Member Strozik. Uh, I uh, agree with Member Nanke, and uh, maybe I'm confused, but I don't recall the chair of the Budget Committee ever being restricted from making motions. Uh, I, I do not recall that. I know that on the city boards I've served on, and of course on city council, uh, none of the members' rights are restricted, and I would object to restricting the rights of any member. Uh, and p if someone isn't able to run the meeting and also make and discuss motions, then they probably should not uh, serve as chair. <laughs> but uh, I, I just couldn't support restricting any of us uh, in our ability to participate. Sir, anyone else? But, but I am correct when I say that we did make that change last year, correct? That's correct. You, last year you adopted these procedures or, right. or rules modeled, as Mr. Nanke said, after the council rules. Uh, since I can still debate, I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for you completely hog time, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not uh, particularly familiar with the chair making. When I was uh, chair before, I, I don't recall ever making a motion. I, I'm very sympathetic to uh, Member Nanke's description of the problem because the chair does have things uh, to keep a, a, a meeting moving where there become routine motions trying to, to uh, find somebody to make the motion as rapidly as you want to, or you're going to find yourselves uh, at various times getting really bogged down in somebody trying to find somebody, you know, I, and, and it is difficult. If I uh, look over and I see Councillor Thomas and I say, Councillor Thomas, do you have a motion too? She may not be ready or she may be perfectly ready, and, and it, it is a difficult uh, problem. So I would just suggest, uh, I, I would like if you, uh, you and your second would look at it, I would ask you to, to pull back on this. I'd really like to think about this a little bit. I think other counselors would too. Uh, uh, either that or defeat the motion. I, uh, I, I just don't think it'll help in terms of the progress of these meetings. This is gonna get very difficult at times and it's just keeping the thing moving. Uh, I certainly am sympathetic to what you're saying in terms of the chair trying to run the show completely. Uh, no problem. I've got Nanky here to help me so that it won't happen to <laughs> me. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, if you don't mind, uh, I, 
I, would, I don't have a copy of the rules in front of me, neither do I believe the other members have a copy in front of them. And I, I think this might be something, if you see a, a situation that you think becomes abusive, these are in front of us at every meeting, but they aren't tonight because we don't have them at hand, as you pointed out. Well, again, no, what we're coming up against this year, that was why I made the suggestion. I'm sure. more than happy to withdraw the motion. Great. Thank you. Will your right. second join you? Um, is there a reason we couldn't defer consideration of the motion? Rather you uh, effectively are deferring it by withdrawing your motion. You can bring it up any time at any meeting under this section of business. If you, if you see a problem and you think this needs to be handled this way, uh, I think what you'll find is that uh, this will only impede our progress and lengthen these meetings. It, it, it already has. I, I would just suggest that we pull back on this, take a look at it later. I've just, just a piece of good advice, I think. Uh, okay, I'm just curious about, about the, the deferral. Uh, I, I seconded for the purposes of discussion, so I'm, I'm happy to withdraw. Great, thank you very much. Is there any other business? Uh, I, I, I know, I'm sorry, I apologize. No, no. Okay, section 18 in the procedures takes a vote of two-thirds of all members of the budget committee currently. I mean, look around the room. Yeah. I mean, the odds of ever getting two-thirds of the members here, let alone voting, are somewhat remote. I would like to make a motion that uh, to amend uh, section 18 that um, replace the language by a vote of two-thirds of all members of the budget committee to a vote of uh, the majority of all members of the budget committee. Seconded by Member Motley. Member uh, The only slight clarification I would add is uh, by state law we have to have 10 members uh, vote affirmatively for any motion to pass. True. So it... I, w I wonder if I could make a suggestion. Because the other members don't have copies of the rules in front of them, I wonder if it would be possible, Member McElvey, if you could send your <coughs> suggested motions out to budget committee members and we'll make sure everyone has a copy of the procedures and rules in their hands and then something that can come up at the next meeting. Yeah, and, and I apologize. I oh, no. intended to do this and I should have asked for them to be distributed. So I'll withdraw that motion and I'll put something out in writing. But okay. the okay. next meeting, I, I'll probably revive then both motions. Okay. Particularly the one on section 18 of the two thirds of all members. So. I, th I think these are important matters and it seems like it would just be helpful for the members to have the copy of the rules in front of them. I'm just shocked that not everybody has them memorized. Member no. <laughs> <laughs> Nanky. Yeah, and, and essentially with that piece, uh, we would want to actually look at all of the other majority and quorum type requirements as well right. if we were going to modify one. Um, but if, for my recollection in regards to rule changes, does the motion need to come before or be given to the body seven days before the meeting, or is it um, put forward and then voted on at the next meeting? How 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 was that Ms. written? Neville, because do you have that information? Um, if I might chime in, that section that talks about amending it says that the uh, vote by the members of the budget committee provided that the proposed amendments or new procedures have been introduced into the record at a prior budget committee meeting, not less than six days prior to the budget committee action. So our next budget committee meeting is in January on the 11th. You could consider this as entering it into the record and then take action on the 11th of January. Even though they were introduced and then rescinded, does that take well, away their introduction? Right, yeah, or you could introduce them again on the 11th and then vote on the 25th. Right, that yeah, would so be the yeah, safest. By pulling back, the, yeah. that introduction is no longer uh, I think in what, place for this. Yeah, I think what we have is, is really adequate notice that, that we ought to get ourselves copies of the rules here and uh, that uh, uh, Terry has plans to make 
additional motion. I would assume others do too as we take a look at it and, and uh, that would be just very helpful. But it, it would also, I just as uh, I think you can see from this evening, making those available to members uh, well in advance so we know what's, what we're talking about exactly when you're talking two-thirds votes and things would just be, it, it would certainly expedite this. Okay? <clears throat> Member Motley. Yeah, it's just speaking uh, concerning the state requirement and uh, minimums and majorities. Ten would be a majority since the body is 18. Yep. Thank you. Right. Okay, and is there any other business? Member Keitelweit. Um, I was wondering, um, House Bill 2425, Deborah, does that affect us besides the um, requirement to publish only one or have only one publication of a meeting? I am not completely versed in that House bill, so I cannot answer your question. Okay, I, I, I had signed up on the, um, for the listserv for local public um, budget law, and they provide a nice little summary, and, and I was just curious if there's anything that affects us, how we do business, if maybe we need to talk about it at one of the next meetings. Yeah, I don't anticipate any change in business. There are some uh, changes to the notification, public notice requirements, uh, okay. and that is uh, the one of the primary changes, and then there's some, just some yeah. language Th changes. That's the one I picked up. I was wondering if there's anything I missed, maybe. Yeah, that's the one I picked up also. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there any other business? Okay, without objection, <laughs> we'll adjourn the budget committee. Do we have an executive session? <laughs> okay. No, we do not. It's rare that I have to leave from the chair. <laughs> <laughs>